Chapter 6 It may seem odd to you, but it was two days before I could follow up the new-found clue in what was manifestly the proper way. I felt a peculiar shrinking from those pallid bodies. They were just the half-bleached color of the worms and things one sees preserved in spirit in a zoological museum. And they were filthily cold to the touch. Probably my shrinking was largely due to the sympathetic influence of the Eloi, whose disgust of the Morlocks I now began to appreciate. The next night I did not sleep well. Probably my health was a little disordered. I was oppressed with perplexity and doubt. Once or twice I had a feeling of intense fear, for which I could perceive no definite reason. I remember creeping noiselessly into the great hall, where the little people were sleeping in the moonlight. That night Weena was among them, and feeling reassured by their presence. It occurred to me even then that in the course of a few days the moon must pass through its last quarter, and the nights grow dark when the appearances of these unpleasant creatures from below, these whitened lemurs, this new vermin that had replaced the old, might be more abundant. And on both these days I had the restless feeling of one who shirks an inevitable duty. I felt assured that the time machine was only to be recovered by boldly penetrating these underground mysteries. Yet I could not face the mystery. If only I had had a companion it would have been different. But I was so horribly alone, and even to clamber down into the darkness of the well appalled me. I don't know if you will understand my feeling, but I never felt quite safe at my back. It was this restlessness, this insecurity perhaps, that drove me further and further afield in my exploring expeditions. Going to the southwestward, towards the rising country that is now called Combe Wood, I observed, far off, in the direction of nineteenth-century Banstead, a vast green structure, different in character from any I had hitherto seen. It was larger than the largest of the palaces or ruins I knew, and the façade had an oriental look, the face of it having the luster, as well as the pale green tint, a kind of bluish-green of a certain type of Chinese porcelain. This difference in aspect suggested a difference in use, and I was minded to push on and explore. But the day was growing late, and I had come upon the sight of the place after a long and tiring circuit, so I resolved to hold over the adventure for the following day, and I returned to the welcome and the caresses of little Weena. But next morning I perceived clearly enough that my curiosity regarding the palace of green porcelain was a piece of self-deception, to enable me to shirk, by another day, an experience I dreaded. I resolved I would make the descent without further waste of time, and started out in the early morning towards a well near the ruins of granite and aluminium. Little Weena ran with me. She danced beside me to the well, but when she saw me lean over the mouth and look downward, she seemed strangely disconcerted. "'Good-bye, little Weena,' I said, kissing her, and then putting her down, I began to feel over the parapet for the climbing-hooks. Rather hastily, I may as well confess, for I feared my courage might leak away. At first she watched me in amazement. Then she gave a most piteous cry, and running to me, she began to pull at me with her little hands. I think her opposition nerved me rather to proceed. I shook her off, perhaps a little roughly, and in another moment I was in the throat of the well. I saw her agonized face over the parapet, and smiled to reassure her. Then I clung to look down at the unstable hooks to which I clung. I had to clamber down a shaft of perhaps two hundred yards. The descent was effected by means of metallic bars projecting from the sides of the well, and these being adapted to the needs of a creature much smaller and lighter than myself, I was speedily cramped and fatigued by the descent. And not simply fatigued. One of the bars bent suddenly under my weight, and almost swung me off into the blackness beneath. For a moment I hung by one hand, and after that experience I did not dare to rest again though my arms and back were presently acutely painful, 
I went on clambering down the sheer descent with as quick a motion as possible. Glancing upward, I saw the aperture, a small blue disk in which a star was visible, while little Weena's head showed as a round black projection. The thudding sound of a machine below grew louder and more oppressive. Everything save that little disk above was profoundly dark, and when I looked up again, Weena had disappeared. I was in an agony of discomfort. I had some thought of trying to go up the shaft again and leave the underworld alone. But even while I turned this over in my mind, I continued to descend. At last, with intense relief, I saw dimly coming up, a foot to the right of me, a slender loophole in the wall. Swinging myself in, I found it was the aperture of a narrow horizontal tunnel in which I could lie down and rest. It was not too soon. My arms ached, my back was cramped, and I was trembling with the prolonged terror of a fall. Besides this, the unbroken darkness had had a distressing effect upon my eyes. The air was full of the throb and hum of machinery pumping air down the shaft. I do not know how long I lay. I was roused by a soft hand touching my face. Starting up in the darkness, I snatched at my matches, and, hastily striking one, I saw three stooping white creatures, similar to the one I had seen above ground in the ruin, hastily retreating before the light. Living, as they did, in what appeared to me impenetrable darkness, their eyes were abnormally large and sensitive, just as are the pupils of the abysmal fishes, and they reflected the light in the same way. I have no doubt they could see me in that rayless obscurity, and they did not seem to have any fear of me apart from the light. But so soon as I struck a match in order to see them, they fled incontinently, vanishing into dark gutters and tunnels, from which their eyes glared at me in the strangest fashion. I tried to call to them, but the language they had was apparently different from that of the overworld people, so that I was needs left to my own unaided efforts, and the thought of flight before exploration was even then in my mind. But, I said to myself, you are in for it now, and feeling my way along the tunnel, I found the noise of machinery grow louder. Presently the walls fell away from me, and I came into a large open space, and striking another match saw that I had entered a vast arched cavern, which stretched into utter darkness beyond the range of my light. The view I had of it was as much as one could see in the burning of a match. Necessarily, my memory is vague. Great shapes, like big machines, rose out of the dimness and cast grotesque black shadows, in which dim spectral Morlocks sheltered from the glare. The place, by the by, was very stuffy and oppressive, and a faint halitus of freshly shed blood was in the air. Some way down the central vista was a little table of white metal, laid with what seemed a meal. The Morlocks, at any rate, were carnivorous. Even at the time, I remember wondering what large animal could have survived to furnish the red joint I saw? It was all very indistinct. The heavy smell, the big, unmeaning shapes, the obscene figures lurking in the shadows, and only waiting for the darkness to come at me again. Then the match burned down and stung my fingers and fell, a wriggling red spot in the blackness. I have thought since how particularly ill-equipped I was for such an experience. When I had started with the time machine, I had started with the absurd assumption that the men of the future would certainly be infinitely ahead of ourselves in all their appliances. I had come without arms, without medicine, without anything to smoke. At times I missed tobacco frightfully. Even without enough matches. If only I had thought of a Kodak! I could have flashed that glimpse of the underworld in a second, and examined it at leisure. But, as it was, I stood there with only the weapons and the powers that nature had endowed me with—hands, feet, and teeth—these and four safety matches that still remain to me. I was afraid to push my way in among all this machinery in the dark, 
and it was only with my last glimpse of light I discovered that my store of matches had run low. It had never occurred to me until that moment that there was any need to economize them, and I had wasted almost half the box in astonishing the upper-worlders, to whom fire was a novelty. Now, as I say, I had four left, and while I stood in the dark, a hand touched mine, lank fingers came feeling over my face, and I was sensible of a peculiar, unpleasant odor. I fancied I heard the breathing of a crowd of these dreadful little beings about me. I felt the box of matches in my hand being gently disengaged, and other hands behind me plucking at my clothing. The sense of these unseen creatures examining me was indescribably unpleasant. The sudden realization of my ignorance of their ways of thinking and doing came home to me very vividly in the darkness. I shouted at them as loudly as I could. They started away, and then I could feel them approaching me again. They clutched at me more boldly, whispering odd sounds to each other. I shivered violently, and shouted again rather discordantly. This time they were not so seriously alarmed, and they made a queer laughing noise as they came back at me. I will confess I was horribly frightened. I determined to strike another match and escape under the protection of its glare. I did so, and, eking out the flicker with a scrap of paper from my pocket, I made good my retreat to the narrow tunnel. But I had scarce entered this when my light was blown out, and in the darkness I could hear the Morlocks rustling like wind among leaves, and pattering like the rain as they hurried after me. In a moment I was clutched by several hands, and there was no mistaking that they were trying to haul me back. I struck another light and waved it in their dazzled faces. You can scarce imagine how nauseatingly inhuman they looked, those pale, chinless faces and great, lidless, pinkish-gray eyes, as they stared in their blindness and bewilderment. But I did not stay to look, I promise you. I retreated again, and when my second match had ended I struck my third. It had almost burned through when I reached the opening into the shaft. I laid down on the edge, for the throb of the great pump below made me giddy. Then I felt sideways for the projecting hooks, and as I did so my feet were grasped from behind, and I was violently tugged backward. I lit my last match, and it incontinently went out. But I had my hand on the climbing bars now, and kicking violently I disengaged myself from the clutches of the Morlocks, and was speedily clambering up the shaft, while they stayed peering and blinking up at me. All but one little wretch who followed me for some way, and well-nigh secured my boot as a trophy. That climb seemed interminable to me. With the last twenty or thirty feet of it a deadly nausea came upon me. I had the greatest difficulty in keeping my hold. The last few yards was a frightful struggle against this faintness. Several times my head swam, and I felt all the sensations of falling. At last, however, I got over the well-mouth somehow, and staggered out of the ruin into the blinding sunlight. I fell upon my face. Even the soil smelt sweet and clean. Then I remember Weena kissing my hands and ears, and the voices of others among the Eloi. Then, for a time, I was insensible. CHAPTER Seven. Now, indeed, I seemed in a worse case than before. Hitherto, except during my night's anguish at the loss of the time-machine, I had felt a sustaining hope of ultimate escape, but that hope was staggered by these new discoveries. Hitherto I had merely thought myself impeded by the childish simplicity of the little people, and by some unknown forces, which I had only to understand to overcome. But there was an altogether new element in the sickening quality of the Morlocks, a something inhuman and malign. Instinctively I loathed them. Before I had felt as a man might feel who had fallen into a pit. My concern was with the pit and how to get out of it. Now I felt like a beast in a trap, whose enemy would come upon him soon. The enemy I dreaded may surprise you. 
It was the darkness of the new moon. Weena had put this into my head by some, at first, incomprehensible remarks about the dark nights. It was not now such a very difficult problem to guess what the coming of dark nights might mean. The moon was on the wane. Each night there was a longer interval of darkness. And now I understood to some slight degree, at least, the reason of the fear of the little upper-world people for the dark. I wondered vaguely what foul villainy it might be that the Morlocks did under the new moon. I felt pretty sure now that my second hypothesis was all wrong. The upper-world people might once have been the favored aristocracy, and the Morlocks their mechanical servants. But that had long since passed away. The two species that had resulted from the evolution of man were sliding down towards, or had already arrived at, an altogether new relationship. The Eloi, like the Carolingian kings, had decayed to a mere beautiful futility. They still possessed the earth on sufferance, since the Morlocks, subterranean for innumerable generations, had come at last to find the daylit surface intolerable. And the Morlocks made their garments, I inferred, and maintained them in their habitual needs, perhaps through the survival of an old habit of service. They did it as a standing horse paws with his foot, or as a man enjoys killing animals in sport, because ancient and departed necessities had impressed it on the organism. But clearly the old order was already in part reversed. The nemesis of the delicate ones was creeping on apace. Ages ago, thousands of generations ago, man had thrust his brother-man out of the ease and the sunshine, and now that brother was coming back changed. Already the Eloi had begun to learn one old lesson anew. They were becoming reacquainted with fear. And suddenly there came into my head the memory of the meat I had seen in the underworld. It seemed odd how it floated into my mind, not stirred up, as it were, by the current of my meditations, but coming in almost like a question from outside. I tried to recall the form of it. I had a vague sense of something familiar, but I could not tell what it was at the time. Still, however helpless the little people in the presence of their mysterious fear, I was differently constituted. I came out of this age of ours, this ripe prime of the human race when fear does not paralyze and mystery has lost its terrors. I, at least, would defend myself. Without further delay, I determined to make myself arms and a fastness where I might sleep. With that refuge as a base, I could face this strange world with some of that confidence I had lost in realizing to what creatures night by night I lay exposed. I felt I could never sleep again until my bed was secure from them. I shuddered with horror to think how they must already have examined me. I wandered during the afternoon along the valley of the Thames, but found nothing that commended itself to my mind as inaccessible. All the buildings and trees seemed easily practical to such dexterous climbers as the Morlocks, to judge by their wells, must be. Then the tall pinnacles of the Palace of Green Porcelain and the polished gleam of its walls came back to my memory and in the evening, taking Weena like a child upon my shoulder, I went up the hills towards the southwest. The distance, I had reckoned, was seven or eight miles, but it must have been near eighteen. I had first seen the place on a moist afternoon, when distances are deceptively diminished. In addition, the heel of one of my shoes was loose, and a nail was working through the sole. They were comfortable old shoes I wore about indoors, so that I was lame and it was already long past sunset when I came in sight of the palace, silhouetted black against the pale yellow of the sky. Weena had been hugely delighted when I began to carry her, but after a while she desired me to let her down and ran along by the side of me, occasionally darting off on either hand to pick flowers to stick in my pockets. My pockets had always puzzled Weena, but at the last she had concluded that they were an eccentric kind of vase for floral decoration. At least she utilized them for that purpose. And that reminds me, in changing my jacket I found— The time-traveler paused, put his hand into his pocket, 
and silently placed two withered flowers, not unlike very large white mallows, upon the little table. Then he resumed his narrative. As the hush of the evening crept over the world, and we proceeded over the hill crest towards Wimbledon, Weena grew tired and wanted to return to the house of Grey Stone. But I pointed out the distant pinnacles of the Palace of Green Porcelain to her, and contrived to make her understand that we were seeking a refuge there from her fear. You know that great pause that comes upon things before the dusk? Even the breeze stops in the trees. To me there is always an air of expectation about that evening stillness. The sky was clear, remote, and empty, save for a few horizontal bars far down in the sunset. Well, that night the expectation took the color of my fears. In that darkling calm my senses seemed preternaturally sharpened. I fancied I could even feel the hollowness of the ground beneath my feet, could, indeed, almost see through it the Morlocks on their anthill, going hither and thither and waiting for the dark. In my excitement I fancied that they would receive my invasion of their burrows as a declaration of war. And why had they taken my time-machine? So we went on in the quiet, and the twilight deepened into night. The clear blue of the distance faded, and one star after another came out. The ground grew dim and the trees black. Weena's fears and her fatigue grew upon her. I took her in my arms and talked to her and caressed her. Then, as the darkness grew deeper, she put her arms round my neck and, closing her eyes, tightly pressed her face against my shoulder. So we went down a long slope into a valley, and there, in the dimness, I almost walked into a little river. This I waited, and went up on the opposite side of the valley, past a number of sleeping-houses, and by a statue, a fawn or some such figure, minus the head. Here, too, were acacias. So far I had seen nothing of the Morlocks, but it was yet early in the night, and the darker hours before the old moon rose were still to come. From the brow of the next hill I saw a thick wood spreading wide and black before me. I hesitated at this. I could see no end to it, either to the right or the left. Feeling tired, my feet in particular were very sore, I carefully lowered Weena from my shoulder as I halted, and sat down upon the turf. I could no longer see the palace of green porcelain, and I was in doubt of my direction. I looked into the thickness of the wood, and thought of what it might hide. Under that dense tangle of branches, one would be out of sight of the stars. Even were there no other lurking danger, a danger I did not care to let my imagination loose upon, there would still be all the roots to stumble over and the tree boles to strike against. I was very tired, too, after the excitements of the day, so I decided that I would not face it, but would pass the night upon the open hill. Weena, I was glad to find, was fast asleep. I carefully wrapped her in my jacket and sat down beside her to wait for the moonrise. The hillside was quiet and deserted, but from the black of the wood there came now and then a stir of living things. Above me shone the stars, for the night was very clear. I felt a certain sense of friendly comfort in their twinkling. All the old constellations had gone from the sky, however that slow movement which is imperceptible in a hundred human lifetimes, had long since rearranged them in unfamiliar groupings. But the Milky Way, it seemed to me, was still the same tattered streamer of stardust as of yore. Southward, as I judged it, was a very bright red star that was new to me. It was even more splendid than our own green Sirius. And amid all these scintillating points of light, one bright planet shone kindly and steadily, like the face of an old friend. Looking at these stars suddenly dwarfed my own troubles and all the gravities of terrestrial life. I thought of their unfathomable distance, and the slow, inevitable drift of their movements out of the unknown past into the unknown future. I thought of the great processional cycle that the pole of the earth describes. 
Only forty times had that silent revolution occurred during all the years that I had traversed. And during these few revolutions, all the activity, all the traditions, the complex organizations, the nations, languages, literatures, aspirations, even the mere memory of man as I knew him, had been swept out of existence. Instead were these frail creatures, who had forgotten their high ancestry, and the white things of which I went in terror. Then I thought of the great fear that was between the two species, and for the first time, with a sudden shiver, came the clear knowledge of what the meat I had seen might be. Yet it was too horrible. I looked at little Weena sleeping beside me, her face white and star-like under the stars, and forthwith dismissed the thought. Through that long night I held my mind off the Morlocks as well as I could, and whiled away the time by trying to fancy I could find signs of the old constellations in the new confusion. The sky kept very clear, except for a hazy cloud or so. No doubt I dozed at times. Then, as my vigil wore on, came a faintness in the eastward sky, like the reflection of some colorless fire, and the old moon rose, thin and peaked and white. And close behind, and overtaking it, and overflowing it, the dawn came, pale at first, and then growing pink and warm. No Morlocks had approached us. Indeed, I had seen none upon the hill that night. And in the confidence of renewed day, it almost seemed to me that my fear had been unreasonable. I stood up and found my foot with the loose heel swollen at the ankle, and painful under the heel. So I sat down again, took off my shoes, and flung them away. I awakened Weena, and we went down into the wood, now green and pleasant, instead of black and forbidding. We found some fruit wherewith to break our fast. We soon met others of the dainty ones, laughing and dancing in the sunlight, as though there were no such thing in nature as the night. And then I thought once more of the meat I had seen. I felt assured now of what it was, and from the bottom of my heart I pitied this last feeble rill from the great flood of humanity. Clearly, at some time in the long ago of human decay, the Morlocks' food had run short. Possibly they had lived on rats and such like vermin. Even now man is far less discriminating and exclusive in his food than he was, far less than any monkey. His prejudice against human flesh is no deep-seated instinct. And so these inhuman sons of men... I tried to look at the thing in a scientific spirit. After all, they were less human and more remote than our cannibal ancestors of three or four thousand years ago. And the intelligence that would have made this state of things a torment had gone. Why should I trouble myself? These Eloi were mere fatted cattle, which the ant-like Morlocks preserved and preyed upon, probably saw to the breeding of. And there was Weena dancing at my side. Then I tried to preserve myself from the horror that was coming upon me, by regarding it as a rigorous punishment of human selfishness. Man had been content to live in ease and delight upon the labors of his fellow-man, had taken necessity as his watchword and excuse, and in the fullness of time necessity had come home to him. I even tried a Carlyle-like scorn of this wretched aristocracy in decay. But this attitude of mind was impossible. However great their intellectual degradation, the Eloi had kept too much of the human form not to claim my sympathy, and to make me perforce a sharer in their degradation and their fear. I had, at that time, very vague ideas as to the course I should pursue. My first was to secure some safe place of refuge, and to make myself such arms of metal or stone as I could contrive. That necessity was immediate. In the next place, I hoped to procure some means of fire, so that I should have the weapon of a torch at hand, for nothing I knew would be more efficient against these Morlocks. 
Then I wanted to arrange some contrivance to break open the doors of bronze under the White Sphinx. I had in mind a battering ram. I had a persuasion that if I could enter those doors and carry a blaze of light before me, I should discover the time machine and escape. I could not imagine the Morlocks were strong enough to move it far away. Weena I had resolved to bring with me to our own time, and, turning such schemes over in my mind, I pursued our way towards the building which my fancy had chosen as our dwelling.